Grace Lee and all them children will even go to Children's Church. And uh, I'm sure if anyone would like to help, I'm sure Rachel would love to help. And uh, but the great, great group of kids. Uh, for those that's joining us on Facebook Live, we appreciate you joining us this morning. And I want to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of Titus. Titus in the New Testament. As uh, we were working our way through this, this book, that uh, as you notice, it's only three, <clears throat> three chapters, maybe 45, 46 verses in all, but been a, a great book so far. This is our fourth, fourth sermon in the, in the series here. And uh, we want to look today at verses 10 through 16 in the last part of chapter 1. And uh, if we had a title today, it would be the Beware of False Teaching. Beware of False Teaching. As we finished our sermon last week, we kind of uh, let you know that, you know, even though this was the issue that Titus was going to have to deal with here uh, back on the island of Crete, it is something that we still have to deal with today. Uh, we need to have our, our, our guard up, so to speak, as we have so many avenues that we can uh, get teaching and preaching from online and, and in person and, and on TVs and things like that. And, and we have to be grounded in our faith and know the Word of God so that we can be able to detect when there is false teachings also. And, um, and we'll talk a little more about that at the end. But we want to read this morning verses 10. Uh, to the end of the chapter, which is verse 16. And as Paul was writing to Titus, he continued to say, For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. Being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you again for today. And Lord, as we come to this time of the service, Lord, we thank you for your word. We know that your word is true, Lord, and that your word is forever settled in heaven. Lord, as we open it today, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to stand. But Lord, we know we cannot stand in our own strength. And Lord, how we, we need you this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would just lead us in, in the truth, Lord, and to be able to expound the scriptures to know the truth and how to apply it to our lives each and every day. Lord, again, I pray, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen and amen. As we think about false teachers this morning, we know that as when you look at what's going on and what uh, Paul tells Titus to be looking for in these false teachers and what they have been teaching, uh, we can see that it's really just the opposite of what he was telling Titus to find when he was out in the churches looking for the elders. We, we looked at verses 5 through 9 last week and what uh, Titus was to find in a, a elder to be a spiritual leader in each of these congregations. We talked about how that in these churches, in these small congregations even, and, and even what we might even refer to as newer congregations, there was many that came to know the Lord, but there was not many in there that maybe had the spiritual knowledge and the spiritual uh, learning to be able to, to detect, you know, false teaching. And so as we look at this, I just want to let you know that, you know, any time that God has established anything, and we'll just look at the church today, Satan always has his counterfeit. 
And you know, anything that God has, Satan wants to do the opposite, to, to not to allow people to get closer to God, but really to, to deceive them to go further away from God. And, and so as we think about that, we know that Satan's main tool that he uses uh, each and every day is deception. That he is a uh, uh, he is wicked and he is evil, but his purpose and everything he does is to to deceive. And we have to remember that the Bible even says that he will even present himself as an angel of light. You know, too many times we have this visual picture in our mind of a uh, a man in a, a red jumpsuit carrying a pitchfork and. And, you know, with a red cape or whatever, and, and he's someone that we can uh, easily see and easily detect that that is the devil, and that, therefore, we know to run the other way. But, you know, in all honesty, we all know for a fact today that as, as we battle the devil each and every day, he's not always someone that we can detect, but it's someone that can uh, easily you know, uh, show himself in a subtle way, and, and in that in that subtlety of him doing what he's doing, he is he is misleading us, and he's leading us away from what God would really have us to know. See, that's what was happening here. You know that these teachers, you know, because they had not, uh, they were only given what we would call half the truth. And what we know about half truths is that a half truth is a whole lie, and and so that's what was happening in this church. And and the problem was again that these young churches and these young congregations that were meeting in their homes and meeting uh, in you know their uh, houses and and really had a heart to do because they had been saved and they would want to grow in their faith and. But they were being led down a dead end road and didn't even realize it. But when you take someone like the Apostle Paul that, that had came and had began these churches, and as they began, as he began these congregations, he would teach them that truth, you know, that had to be in what we know as the gospel now, uh, as, as Paul would go on to his way to another missionary journey, you know, then the teachers would go the kind of the opposite way of what he was teaching. And that's why uh, Paul sent Titus to find these elders and to, to make sure that these churches were going to be uh, taught uh, the right way and to, to lead others in the right way. See, as we think about <clears throat> these false teachers, it's not saying that they were bad people. They were probably really good people, you know, and, and maybe even had a heart for what was right. But we all know that we have this natural bit in us to, uh, as the natural person that we are, to sometimes go uh, the opposite way. And we all need uh, people in our lives and elders in our lives and spiritual leaders in our lives that, that can look into our own lives and see if there's things that in our life are not lining up with the Word of God to help us get back in line. See, you remember even Jesus warned about these good people because they looked the part. You know, and he even said in Matthew 7, 15, he said, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. See, some of these false teachers came for no other purpose than to deceive. It wasn't just a mistake that they made, that they had the the motive and the attitude that they wanted to take people away from the Christ teaching. And that's what he was doing. Paul even said it in Acts chapter 20. In verse 29, he says, I know that after my departing, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. So I say that to say that, you know, in like every uh, battle that we kind of think that we have, there is God's side, and then there is Satan's side. And Satan has his minions, you know, that is there to do nothing but to take people away uh, from the truth. 
You know, we have to be aware of and know our Bible and know truth and doctrine so that we do not get carried away. You know, it's kind of like the old story or the old fable of, about <clears throat> boiling a frog. You know, you can you take a, a pot of water and you get that water boiling and you drop a frog in and it's just going to jump out because of the, the heat. But they say that you can take a, a, a pot of water and have just room temperature water and set it on the stove and put that frog in it and he'll swim. And then as you slowly turn up the heat to where then it's boiling, that he'll stay there until he dies. And a lot of times, false teaching is just that. They're not going to walk in the door or come and say that, hey, I'm a false teacher, here I am. They're going to slowly, you know, kind of weasel their way in until it's too late. And then you end up on that dead end road that we've already mentioned. Two things right off the bat that come to mind that I want to make sure that we kind of understand. You know, as believers, and no matter what age you are or how long you've been following Christ, the Bible teaches that we have to test all the spirits. You know, we need to know when you hear something preached or you hear something taught that you do not just always take it at face value, but you know how to take it to the Bible and to study it to know what the truth is. You know, we have to, and if you have uh, difficulties in that, then you need to find you a pastor or an elder or someone that can help lead you in the truth. You know, and the second thing that would be is if a, per a person teaching or a person preaching that says something that, and they say this was given to me by a, a personal revelation of, of God, and they do not have uh, a biblical reference, you know, run. <laughs> because I want to tell you this morning that God has given us what he has to say. And it comes in 66 books that are made up of one book that we know is our Bible. And he has said what he needs us to, to hear. Because no doctrine, and this is any doctrine, in the Bible is made up of just one verse. You can find doctrine. You will find it as it goes from cover to cover. You know, and, and so many people and so many uh, religions will call it this morning has tried to base their religion on just one verse. And I want to tell you, we have to be careful with that. So I want to just give you just a few points this morning. First of all, I want you to see and ask the question, or who were these false teachers that Titus would be facing? Verse 10, Paul kind of gives a description of who these people are. He tells, first of all, that they were insubordinate. As we think about that, I know in your King James Bible, my, my new King James says insubordinate. I think King James says unruly. And as we think about that, what that means is the word really boils down to mean that they were, were not, they're not put under uh, any rule. Meaning that they, were, they didn't want to be under anyone's authority. You know, they were being uh, basically uh, disobedient to what they had been taught. You know, that they, they wanted to say there again that what I know and what I'm teaching is because God has told me personally this is what we need to know. And so they were not being uh, put under any authority. There is much of that type of teaching is still going on today. And we have to be very careful with that. He goes on to say that these were idle talkers or vain talkers. And, that, you know, when you think about that, they were the type of people that would do uh, something like this. And I know as parents, we probably all said this to our children. Uh, but, you know, we're talking about leading churches and leading people. You know, how that they wanted to say, you do as I say and not do as I do. You know, they would teach one thing, but in another way, they would live their own life in that way. You know, they had, they wanted to be uh, as one of those that as you sat under their teaching, you would understand after a few minutes that really they didn't have anything 
worth saying. <laughs> and, you know, it was just more or less kind of a lot of hot air if you really boiled it down. And so we have to be careful. But then here is what he also warns them, that they were deceivers. And this, uh, I like the description of what this word means. It meant that they were a mind misleader. They wanted to mislead the people in their thinking. You know, they didn't want you to use your brain. They just wanted you to trust them for what they knew and for what they would say they knew more than you did. And so these were all kind of descriptions of who these were. Paul said this in Romans 16 and verse 18. He's talking about false teachers in that, in that chapter. He says, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ but they serve their own belly and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. That is who their, their, who their target was. They wanted people that would not question them. They wanted people that would just simply say, okay, because you're the teacher or because you're the pastor, uh, we will believe that and, and follow that. I want to tell you this morning, as much as I... I, I love you and I try not to uh, mislead in any way. If there is anything that I ever say that is not clear to you, you know, I, I ask you to, to ask me and us talk about it until there is clarity because I don't want to mislead in any way. Uh, I, I know I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed and, and there is times that I can uh, say something maybe in a way that wasn't correct Because I will be accountable one day for what I preach and what I teach. And, and so I, I, I give you that permission, you know, please, because we want to grow together. We want to learn together. And we want to uh, serve our Lord together in the most honest way. But what he was saying here in the most uh, important part is where he puts the emphasis on these people in the last part of verse 10 to say, especially those of the circumcision. Now, this was a group of people that was known as the Judaizers. And the Judaizers were Jewish teachers who they professed to be Christians. And no one's saying that they're not Christians. But what they're saying is that they profess to be believers in Christ, yet they insisted that Christians must be circumcised and observe the ceremonial law. You know, that they, you had to have both. You couldn't say that, yes, I believe in Christ and I believe in his salvation. They said that wasn't enough. What you had to do is say that you were saved, but you also had to carry out all the Jewish laws and you had to also be circumcised. And this is what they were teaching. Well, the thing is that the, the church, the apostles and the elders of the uh, church in Jerusalem had already dealt with this situation. If you can, flip back to Acts chapter 15. This also is what is the kind of the proof that they were being insubordinate. You know, that they had the teaching, you know, that Apostle Paul would have taught and others would have emphasized, but they decided to not go in that and that they were disobedient. But look, and we're not going to read uh, many of this, but I want you to see uh, what was going on. In chapter 15, in verse 1, uh, the Bible says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the uh, custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Okay, jump down to verse 6. So this is what they were discussing. This was what was coming to be a, a doctrine that was going to be taught. Now look in verse 6. It says, Now the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentile should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
So God, who knows the heart, acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. And so that was the decision that came to say, yes, if you are saved, you are saved. You do not have to be saved and also uh, circumcised or follow the ceremonial laws to be saved. And so it's very important that we understand because what the false teachers were saying and in that of being a Judaizer that you had to be saved and keep the law. You know what it boils down to say? That Jesus Christ was not enough. That it took Jesus plus something. And we have to understand that that is still sometimes teaching of today. There are some that says that you, know, you have to have Jesus plus your good works. Or you have to have Jesus plus your tithe. You have to have Jesus plus your membership. Or you have to have Jesus plus your baptism. And I want you to know, is tithing and baptism and membership all important? Absolutely. But it doesn't come from a sense that you think that you have to do it to be saved. It is something that comes out of your heart because you are saved. Because I'm saved, I want to be a part of the local church. Because I'm saved, I want to give my tithes and my talents of what the Lord has blessed me with. Because I'm saved, I want to show the world by my water baptism. You know, all of these things. You know, so many people in this world today, they want to consider that Christianity is just like a, a long train in life. And when you take on Jesus, you just take it to the end and you tag him on the end of what everything else is. I want to tell you this morning that Jesus Christ is not just part of the train. He is the engine. He is all the cars and he is the caboose. It is all about Jesus Christ this morning for your salvation. You know, as you think about it, as we think about Jesus Christ, I couldn't help but think this morning about as, you know, when you're trying to find your way to get somewhere, you're going to find somebody maybe that's already been there. You know, you want to know how to get to a certain city. Maybe you know somebody that was from that city. You're going to find that person because they're going to know the best way to get there. You know what I want? You know, I want to know how to get to heaven someday. But you know what? I'm not going to be able to go and ask Muhammad how to get to heaven. I ain't going to be able to go and ask Buddha how to get to heaven. You know, I'm not going to be able to go and find Joseph Smith of the Latter-day Church how to get to heaven. One, I couldn't dig them up. I don't know where they're at. And they're not going to be alive for me to tell. But I want to tell you what. I can go to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has, knows the way to heaven because he came from heaven. Not only did he come from heaven, he came and he died on this cross. He died for my sin. He was buried. But on that third day, he rose from the grave and he ascended back into heaven. So who do I need to know how to get to heaven? Jesus. Jesus is the only way to heaven. And that is because he's been there and he is there now preparing a home for each of us. How beautiful heaven's going to be. And he is preparing a home for us. Do you know Jesus today? Is he your way? Is he the only way? Because that, that is just the truth. Don't let anybody tell you you got to have Jesus plus anything. It is Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen? Amen. 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 So as we think, that's what the teaching was. The teaching was that it wasn't enough just to know Jesus. You had to have something else. But I want to tell you today, you know, what was Titus to do? Paul gave Titus instructions of what he was going to need to do, you know, to and for these false teachers. <clears throat> he tells them in verse 13, he said that he had to rebuke them 
sharply. See, verse 11 told us that they were teaching things they, they shouldn't even have been teaching. And they were overturning whole households. You know, what was happening is that they were isolating families. Because think of this. We already read in Romans chapter 16 how that they were looking for the simple in heart. And I want to tell you this because as, as much as, you know, as a pastor, I want to lead and, and, and shepherd uh, the flock. You still need to know your Bible. You need to know truth and doctrine on your own. Because a lot of times, these are the ones that's going to be doing what? They're coming knocking on your door. And they're going to begin to isolate you. And, and you're not around other you know, church leaders or other people that can help you. And what they're trying to do is overturn. And if they can overturn what you believe, and all of a sudden you begin to believe differently than what you've been taught, before long the whole household has been overturned. That's why you have to know your Bible for yourself. The Bible says study to show yourself approved unto God. That's why Jude, in his letter, he said this in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. See, we all have to be ready to contend for our faith. We all have to know what we believe and why we believe so that we'll understand and, and see false teaching when it is before you. See, what I like about this, I want you to notice in verse 13, yes, Titus was going to rebuke them. He was going to call them out for their teaching and for who they were. But Paul tells them this in the last part of verse 13. The reason what, why he needed to do what he did. That they may be sound in the faith. See, that's very important. Because in, in looking at that, what, Paul, what Titus was going to be doing is, as he would call out these false teachers, and he would call out the false teachings. He was going to teach them the truth. He wanted not only just to say, I know the truth, but he's like, I want you to know why what you're teaching is not the truth. And when he would teach them, he would give them that opportunity to say, for them to recognize what they were teaching was wrong and why they needed to turn back to the truth. Because it wasn't that they was casting them out, you know, from the church. He was just going to give them direction on how they could get back into the right path. But if they would not come to that point of repentance, you know, of showing and saying, I'm sorry for what I was teaching was wrong and I want to turn back into the truth and, and teach the truth. See, that would be the moment of repentance and, and they would be put back on, on the path. But if they refused to do that, then there would be measures down the road of, of church discipline that would remove them from the church. But first and foremost, it was to get them back into the right way. You know, back into that way. Because, see, what had triggered this for this false teaching and what triggered it to make them continue to teach false teaching, he also told us back in, up, up in verse 11. Look, it said, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. See, it all of a sudden for these teachers became a greedy thing. You know, they, you know, maybe, I don't know, did an a, a info commercial and said, you know, if you want to be saved, you send me $10 and I'll make sure you're saved. Well, people started sending in their money. It was dishonest gain. And all of a sudden that, that teacher is like, hey, I can make a pretty good look on this. And it continued. And see, it was for that dishonest gain that was their trigger. And so what would, what would Titus be doing? Titus would be calling them out to say, what you're doing is wrong. And 
and to do it for money is absolutely wrong. And you have the opportunity to turn. And if they would, they would be brought back into uh, the, the peace of the church. But if they wouldn't, then there would be, you know, measures taken to get them out. But see, Paul's purpose in everything that he did was to get people in the right way and not leave them in the wrong way. So he was going to rebuke them. But here's where I want the application to be. I think we need to understand today that in a lot of ways, you know, not every false teacher comes with that pretense of being a false teacher. I think some of them get, you know, uh, started out with the right motivation, but something happens that takes them off the path. And so I think we have to guard our hearts today to know that, yes, we want to uh, follow Jesus. We know Jesus is the only way. And we want to be honest and true to what we're telling others. And I think there's some things that we need to do in our lives to keep us from becoming that false teacher or false in our faith. And so here's what I think. I think we find these four things in verse 16, and then we will be done. See, number one, what we have to do to protect our heart is we have to make sure that what we say we believe lines up with how we live our life. See what it says in verse 16? It says, they, talking about the false teacher, they profess to know God, but in works they deny it. See, we have to examine our own heart. You know, I'm, I'm glad you're here this morning. But what you're saying in your life, does it line up with what you do between Monday and Saturday? See, we have to understand that people are watching our lives each and every day. I'm not saying you have to be perfect, because none of us are. But we ought to at least have it in our, our heart of hearts that we want to uh, live our life like we know the Lord Jesus Christ. That He is part of our life, and we, we live for Him. You know, we have to do that. The second thing is that we cannot become abominable. And that's what he says here. He says, they profess to know God, but in works they deny him being abominable. Now, I wasn't sure what that word meant, you know, so I had to uh, look it up. But you know what it means? It means idolatrous. That they have become idolatrous. You know, when we think about it, are there things in your life and I have to ask myself, are there things in my life that would be considered idols? You know, I'm not talking about us having a little statue that we put on our mantle at home and we, we pay homage to. It. But is there things in our lives that we would become uh, or come in between us and God? That's a whole lot of things. It seems like we're idols to sometimes. And we have to check our, head, our hearts and to understand that we can't let these things become idols in our lives. You know, that might be, you know, from anything, from our jobs to our house to our cars to the blessings that we have to our phones to all these things that so many times can become an idol in our life. We have to keep these things. It's not that they're not important. And they all play a part in our lives. But if they come more important than our relationship with God, then it's become a bomb. It's become something that we have to remove, that we need to get out of our life. The third thing I would say is that we have to be obedient. You know, he says here to these false teachers, they profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. They're abominable or idolatrous, and they're disobedient. We have to be obedient. As I've already said, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. But as we live our lives, and if we sense the Holy Spirit in our lives leading us to do something or to not do something, either, either way, we have to be we have to learn to obey. Because if we begin by, by you know, disobeying, the next time it's easier for us to continue to disobey. But we have to learn to be obedient. And I, I want to say this, I'm going to say when and not if. When we mess up and we are disobedient, the Holy Spirit, because of Him living in us, 
He will knock on our heart's door to tell us what is wrong. And we have to be obedient in the fact that we want to repent. We want to tell him, I'm sorry for what I did or what I didn't do. And please forgive me and, and, and continue to lead me from, from this point on. And because I want to tell you something. We have to keep short lists with God. We need to stay uh, repentant uh, each and every day so that he continues to work in our hearts and in our lives. And we know that. Because slow responses to what the Holy Spirit leads, leads to no responses. And which leads to more often disobedience. Which no matter how hard you try to justify, and we all try to justify what we do or don't do so many times, disobedience is simply sin. And it is sin against God. And so we need to keep you know, short list with God. The last thing is we have to stay qualified. He says these these false teachers became disqualified for every good work. See, we have to stay qualified. Let me read you what Paul said in 1 Corinthians about this. In chapter 9 and verse 24, he says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? But only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. See, we have to stay qualified in each and everything we do. We do this by knowing the Word of God. We know this by learning. And we learn, you know, sometimes by our mistakes and how to get back on that right path. You know, we, and sometimes it means that you know, yes, we need to know what our Bible says and what is truth and what we believe. But sometimes we need to learn what, what the other parts of religion is teaching incorrectly so we recognize what we must correct. See, and I'll close with this. In every sport, almost every sport, I'm sure there's a few that's not. But there's two sides to the ball. You know, I know football season started and baseball season's been going on, basketball's been going on, but there's always two sides of the ball. You know, there is the one side, there is the, the offense that you're trying to score. You know, you want to get the you know the ball across the line or you want to cross home plate, and, and we all know the, the rules of, of all the sports of how, how we're going to score, and that's from the offensive side. But there's also a time where you have to be defense, that you have to be able to try to defend your goal to keep the other team from scoring. And you know, that's how it is in our lives. We need to know our Bible because that's the offensive side that we have. And we can learn on what we need to know. But there's also a defensive side. You know, we need to understand, you know, the schemes of the devil and what he kind of fires darts at us about and, and he does this. And we need to understand that there is other religions that's not teaching uh, the truth. And we need to be able to detect that and to know because we need to protect our hearts. And that's our defensive side. The greatest thing is God has given us his Holy Spirit to help us in both sides. Amen. He helps us on the offensive side and he helps us on the defensive side. And sometimes he's the one that guards our hearts when we're not smart enough to. But you know, here's the thing that God wants this morning. He wants us to win. And I want to tell you this morning, we win when we give our heart to Jesus Christ. Amen. We give our heart for our salvation 